Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, good morning. I know you might very well be in some part of the world where you're just waking up because I guess the most sensible ones of us who have already taken off, if you're tuned in, it's probably morning in your neck of the wood. So whatever it be, good day to you. So we've been saying a lot because of the week. And um, oh yeah, I remember there were complaints about the audio. Now get this, I'm just learning the road. I'll try to speak and seek to project my voice so that it might get better. And then I'll ask the technical people to help me sort out whatever the issues might be that limits projection of my voice to you. So I'm going to try my best today. I might end up shouting and I don't want headache in addition to dreadlocks. All right. But today we're meant to be going through the questions that have been sent in. At least let's have some sort of feedback. It gives me the opportunity to understand how you might be hearing me, where I might be required to offer clarifications. Um, also, I learned from it as well, the exchange, I've had occasion to argue with a lot of people on the different platforms where I've been engaged. And for me, an argument is not a fight, is not a quarrel, is a way to sharpen each other's thinking. Maybe I was wrong the way I've seen it in the insularity of my own space where I hadn't had the opportunity perhaps to ventilate my own idiocy. And then the other person will call me up and be like, no, it shouldn't be like that. Maybe you have a different view of the same fact. So yeah, we can disagree on opinions as long as we can agree on the facts. So yes, I've had a lot of disagreements and I enjoyed those arguments as well. I enjoyed them. It helps me to sharpen my own thoughts and I hope 
I've managed to either convince you somewhere along the line or perhaps confuse you enough to accept that I have been right in some ways. So it's nice to get these feedbacks and um, I'll, I'll treat them where possible. I'll mention names. In some cases, we've had to aggregate questions because they were more or less repetitive. They were saying the same things, more or less. So I'll be dealing with those questions, but there is something that the I was playing Fela's classic, Look and Laugh, before I came, before I began to talk anyway. That was the music I was listening to. And um, I realized how timeless his words truly are. Because we, as a people, have refused to change. But where Fela could afford to look and laugh over 30 years ago when that song was recorded, that generation blew all the credit card. We can't afford to look and laugh. Do you get it? Wrap your brains around that. Fela could afford to look and laugh. That's the generation Professor Shoyinka calls the wasted generation. If that generation deems itself wasted, what do you think mine is or yours for that matter? That was 30 years ago. He could afford to look and laugh. We can't. We can't afford the luxury of looking and then laughing. We're looking our way like the stupid ones that got shipped off to the slave plantations. This time around, they're keeping the plantations on our own soil. So yeah, you can't afford to look and laugh. Wake the egg hop. Pardon the French. Wake up. Now, that's that. Rant over. Let me now deal with the questions that uh, we had collated. The first one comes from a gentleman, perhaps is a mate, Lakunle. And he goes, why is the Nigerian educational system constantly left in an ugly and poor state? No nation can survive without its intellectuals. See, that question presumes a lot of things. Because think about it. You're asking, why is the Nigerian educational system constantly left in an ugly and poor state? It's deliberate. Get into your head. It is deliberately left in, what is that your ego? It is deliberately left in the ugly and poor state it is in because the rulers have decided to weaponize ignorance. So it is not in their interest to educate you because if you are educated, you question them. Let's get it clear. I went to a village school, Fiditi. Have, have you ever heard of it? Fiditi. Let me repeat myself. Fiditi. It's somewhere on the road to your. The school I went to is better than Grange. I'm not demarketing Grange. It's better than any of the schools in Lagos State where you are paying millions and millions. It's better. It was a village school. Village. So the child of a farmer, the child of a welder, whoever your father or your mother was, you could rise above the status. A village school trained me. I went to St. Stephen's, you know, in day, you know, in day in Ibadan. St. Stephen's. It was the lottery. Anybody, you went to the school closest to your home. It was the poster code lost lottery. I went to St. Stephen's, you know, in day in Ibadan. From there, I went to Abadina Primary School inside you. And it was meant for the children of the of the junior staff of the University of Ibadan and the adjoining villages and neighborhoods. That was, the, that was the school I went to. And from there, I went to Fiditi Grammar School. Fiditi, hear it again. That was the school that trained me. There were teachers from all over the world, Canada, Ghana, Pakistan, India. Fiditi, I repeat it again. So it is not by accident that it has become what it is today. Let us get that clear. It is deliberate. It is deliberate. Everything is deliberate. Every system is designed to produce something. If you wish to enslave a man, you start from here. Nigerians have been deliberately miseducated, deliberately left 
defenseless by ignorance because it suits the purpose of the rulers of Nigeria to make it so. It's not rocket science. It is deliberate. Are we clear? Thank you very much. So let's move on to something else. Oh, he said no nation can survive without its intellectuals. What nation? They don't want you to ever be a nation. If you ever became a nation, you question their authorities. Sovereignty will move away from them. It will move to you if you are educated. Because at the end of the day, how can a nation be based on the aggregation of rights? A citizen should be a citizen, regardless of his ethnic nationality. We should have moved beyond this. But our rulers kept the same colonial system that had always separated us. They have not ever once sought to make a nation of us. So they have no need for intellectuals. When they come into contact with intellectuals, it is with the express desire and design of contaminating and thereby rendering that person complicit in the enslavement of the Nigerian people. So get it clear. The educational system is not in the ugly mess that it is in. By accident, it is by deliberate design. Our rulers are enslavers. Get that clear. Thank you. Now, whoo, you just make me go. They all had under the coal I just there. They come. Yeah. Thank you. Should have put on the AC now. Nah, thought I could survive. Thought I could survive. Phew, we just the fan. But now, my hairs are burning hot. Okay. So, another question is, how can we strengthen our institutions? Uh, strengthen what institutions? If the institutions are strengthened, the powers of the rulers, the power base, the totality of their power base, which is found in the impunity that exists without the, in, the, in the absence of institutions, it simply means that this current system that is ruling us, which by the way, as I've explained in, earlier in the series when we were talking, I did say, now, the one that says, we the people, that constitution, the 1999 one, is a fraud. It has nothing to do with me and you. That was the will of the ruling cabal that handed power, quote and unquote, to the civilian. So if, if, if any we, the we that they were talking about were the Armed Forces Ruling Council, or whatever they called themselves at the time, those band of bandits that sat down inside the belly of the rock and then prepared a document and then called we the people. It wasn't we, it was them. It was them, not us. We had nothing to do with it. Nobody asked us any question. So please, let's be clear about one thing. We cannot have a nation in the absence of institutions. But it pleases the rulers of Nigeria and those who benefit from our enslavement that we are stopped from ever imagining as a nation. And therefore, the law cannot rule. And where the law does not rule, institutions cannot rule. Where institutions do not rule, men rule. And when men rule, it simply means the law does not rule. All you have is impunity. That is why Nigeria is the way it is. So when they are telling you about oh, anti-corruption war, there is no need for any anti-corruption war. All that is required is that the law should rule. If the law rules, everybody will do what they need to do. But the space where impunity exists is why the law cannot be allowed to rule in Nigeria. So institutions, I'm sorry, no institutions are going to be allowed in Nigeria for as long as the law does not rule and the will of men must rule. So your question. So the third one, oh, my brother, great J, Mr. Amumuni, you say, how do we reform or overhaul the entire police system to be at par with what is obtainable in sane climes? Example, the Dubai police. What is wrong with our police systems? Why do they take bribes? <laughs> it's unfair of you guys to keep 
You just keep picking on the police. How is the police any different from any other part of the Nigerian state? The fact of the matter is that when the law does not rule, impunity reigns. So if the Nigerian police is corrupt, but the Nigerian judiciary were to be incorruptible, don't you think there were there, we have enough citizens who believe in the judicial system enough to have cleansed the police? All of us are guilty. You know, there was this song we used to say when we were in last year. When Aluta is coming, we'll be singing, go on a law there. Then we'll be clapping. Then we'll start naming them. Oba Sodion on a law there. Yara Dran on a law there. This one, law there. Babangida. We had all the names. And then we'll be singing and we'll be mentioning those names. You know the truth? It's high time we all looked in the mirror, right? You know what you should be saying? Go, go, wala, law there. Go, go, wala, law there. Nigeria all of us are guilty. Get man, lawyer, or got judge, hmm? custom, general, <laughs> or got DSS, police, hmm? teacher, all of us, clergymen, pastors, imams. Check yourselves. I have no other job. I'm here to prick all of our consciences, peel the scabs, force us to look at ourselves. We can't continue like this. This is not normal. Hmm? It's not normal. Let it go. It's not normal. So, uh, Jai, you cannot have a functional police. You can't. Nothing works in the absence of law. And a land that is not governed by law, where the law does not rule, where the will of men rule, systems do not function. Systems function on predictability, not on the whims and caprices of men. Every system, be it mechanical or civil, whatever the system might be, what makes it systemic is the predictability of the system. The only thing predictable about the Nigerian system it is that it is designed against the people, not for them. So to expect to have a police that works, police men are themselves victims. There are even more victims than you and I. See that one at the protest that is busy slapping people, assaulting them. His children are not going to schools better than the ones your own children are going to as well. He is as much a victim as he is a perpetrator. So all of us are equally guilty. But it's getting to the time where we must all begin to ask ourselves some very serious questions. Can we continue like this? Hmm? Can we? Those are the questions we need to be asking ourselves. So yes, you can't have that kind of, but you can't even have Togolese police. You can't have Ghanaian police. You can't have any sane police because you are not a sane country. You don't have a sane system. You exist on the whims and caprices of men. Base men, for that matter. We have not been caused with men who have sick visions in their head. We have, if we had had only one Kim Jong-un family, imagine what we would have become. Yes, some people would have died. Too bad. But we would have been developed. And at some point, we would have found ourselves enough to have found their path liberation. But these ones, what have they done? What have they done with it? Stupid build houses, flying private jets. They are not even touched by the genius of madness to want to build legacies that will live beyond their lifetimes. No. All they want is to have the biggest house, the biggest car, the biggest this. Small men. Pimpish imaginations. Please, guy, you can't have that kind of police job until you have a system of government that is submitted to law and a people ruled by law. Citizens, not subjects. In the absence of the rule of law, you see the reign of madness that has pervaded our land. So let's be clear about that. Don't expect any good police. Or good educational system or good custom. 
or anything good. How can anything good come out of something if you worry about that in our system? Hmm? All of you talking about good education, good this, you can't have any of those without changing your governance system. Okay. So, hmm? Shola Ogun, that's my guy, Fiditi. We all went to Fiditi Grammar School together. Lagos boy. His family shipped him to Fiditi from Lagos. We went to Fiditi Grammar School together. That's how good he was. So when they tell you it's magic to give you good education, good health care, it's not magic. Nigeria didn't even have this much money. It just didn't have this many thieves. That's the only difference. They've democratized stealing. Democracy and that one, they've federalized it. So we have emirs, in place of governors, ruling councils, in place of houses of assembly. Our courts, don't even let me go there. Hotels. Um, oh, sorry. That would be unfair. There are exceptions in many cases. But generally, everything reflects the state of our country. Everything. So let me go to the next one. So I said, what is your take on the 1999 constitution? Is there anything to add to deduct or should it be totally jettisoned? My position on the 1999 constitution is very clear. Every constitution that has ruled Nigeria, aside from the 1963 constitution, have been the product of rogues. We did not vote them. Those constitutions did not flow from our will. It flowed directly from the barrel of guns wielded by men who do not even have any understanding of what it means to seek immortality by building a nation. Look around you. Look around you. They don't know. Look, forget. All they were thinking of was how to steal. So they were allocating states as fifth guns. That was all it was. It was. They might have called it, they were collecting. So, so that 1999 constitution, let me just call it short, bro. Nothing good can come out of that constitution. Nothing good. It is designed to fail. It just further, in fact, it's the worst of the constitutions that came after the 1963 constitution was abrogated after the civil and after the second coup, after the first coup, rather. So the moment that happened, it wasn't our will anymore. It became the will of men whose primary job was to protect the territorial integrity of Nigeria. They were the ones who started governing us. People trained to kill became our governors, our presidents. One of them is even still our president now. What prepared them for governance? Well, and so please, that 1999 constitution on throwaway and fair, not in the day. 99 of it. Okay, so second question. You said, do you think there can be a non-violent revolution in Nigeria today? Tabla, you referenced the Arab revolution. Do you think the Nigerian? Okay. Let me answer this question for the umpteen time. It is not my responsibility to determine the response of the person to whom I am speaking without any violent intentions. That is the person's problem. So when we, when we speak of non-violent protest, you must understand that I cannot recall a single protest that has ever been called by any Nigerian mass organization that has set out to be violent. It has always been the Nigerian state that has violently repressed the rights of the citizens, both to, the, to have peaceable assembly and to speak to each other, which should be all marks of any democracy. But of course, because we are not a democracy, the same thing that used to happen during the Abacha years, the same way the Nigerian police treated us during the Abacha years, is the exact same way we are still being treated today. So one of the lessons that I believe that those of us who have attempted to change the course of our nation, one of the errors I think we have made consistently, and that we might still be making actually, is that we have focused too often 
on street protests. And then we have failed woefully at the task of connecting the Nigerian people to the struggle for their liberation. Perhaps because we had mischaracterized the struggle as though it was a pro-democracy struggle. It is not. I've said this in one of the lectures earlier in the week. Our struggle is actually a liberation struggle. But we have failed to educate the mass of our people. We've spoken over their heads. We've, we've talked over their heads we, because we ourselves have misunderstood the issues. But if you take the benefit of history, you will find very quickly that the Nigerian state, as dysfunctional as the system is, is also systemic in its madness. It is predictable in the fact that you can predict that when you step onto the street, the Nigerian police on the orders of the state would clamp down on your peaceful protest. You'll, you'll be met with tear gas, sometimes live bullets. The Nigerian police does not see itself as owing the citizens a duty of protection. It sees itself as being the instrument for the preservation of the state. However just or unjust the state is, as far as the law enforcement agencies are concerned, is institutional because this was the colonial police transformed into police of the Nigerian state. So it's about the preservation of the state. It's not really about the preservation of a nation or of the rights of a people. So the right of the average Nigerian does not exist as far as our law enforcement agencies are concerned. But the problem is that we are actually the ones who ought to take it upon ourselves to educate not just the Nigerian people or even the Nigerian police, because the Nigerian police are our brothers and our sisters. Have you been in their barracks? Probably the worst phase of squalor you will find in any Nigerian institution is to be found in the Nigerian police barracks. Leaky pipes, dilapidated buildings, unsuitable accommodations, vermins and rodents, leaky sewer lines, the seediest institutionalized ghetto you will find anywhere in Nigeria are the police barracks. The army barracks are a lot better, perhaps because the need to keep the army in check had led to the need to make sure that they are relatively cocooned from the worst effect of what happens to the police and the warders and the immigration. No, immigration perhaps because those ones, are, they, they get more... Anyway, let me not get into unnecessary trouble with people I don't need to be fighting. But key thing you must understand is this. The... The way we are structured right now, sorry, the way we are structured right now, we are not in any way shaped for the free expression of the people's will to flower in street protest. Even though we are not the ones who wish to be violent, the state will definitely make it violent. And the apathy of the people we have failed to educate in order to connect them to the struggle for their liberation, that apathy has served to make sure that the people themselves are disengaged. So the average trader is angry that you are stopping him from opening his shop. The mother, the parent, everybody is disconnected. So they feel those of you who are protesting when on when. Revolution now will call a protest and you would have less than a thousand people or less turn up. These are brave, brave young men and women who feel that they can prick your consciences and have you out on the street. As far as Nigerians are concerned, they are too focused on survival, that the battle for their liberation is a distraction to them. I see someone remark that if this were to be BB Nigeria, that there will be so many people here, yeah, there would be, because they need to numb their consciousness to the insanity that has pervaded the land. 
And I was speaking with a gentleman earlier today, and the guy was like, oh, my grammar was a little much. I wouldn't get to those to whom it was intended. I said, no, those for whom my messages are intended, we hear me. You are the ambassadors. Go out there, preach it. If I have convinced you, it's your own duty to go out there. You speak your own truth as well. Each one of us has a duty to speak our truth. Go speak your own truth. Speak your own truth. It never dies. Speak it. They will hear you. It's okay. So me, I'm talking. I can see at least, uh, I think, in one case, 69 people, in another 37. So I think on Twitter and Facebook, we have about 100 plus watching. Be the ones to carry that message forward. This was our 12 disciples. 12. One was even a, a an online troll. Like more than day troll now. So imagine and see what impact his ministry has had. You are here. Take it out. My entire purpose is to just prick your consciences, seek to wake you up. So when it comes to the point of delivering a raft of non-physical protests, sit at homes. My own belief is that we can effectively mobilize if we find common cause to get the Nigerian ruler and the state to listen to us, take this chokehold off our necks. The bulk of the people that I speak to are my generation. At least we saw a functional country. So we know what it would be like if we will be allowed to work. So we have a duty. If you're in my generation, if you saw a functional Nigeria, <laughs> you have a duty. You need to speak up. Oshola, I'm sorry. Yes, nonviolence can be effective in bringing change to Nigeria. It is my fervent belief. But I believe that before we get to that point, we need to deal with this point. And this is the point where we talk to ourselves, where we show ourselves clearly that what we are doing is not sustainable. We're already in Mogadishu. And unfortunately, the way it is, Nigeria is already so weak. It's been weakened by the several divisions that have been dumped by our rulers. They've created so many divisions that I'm not even sure that we are structurally sound enough to take the shakings that 2023 is likely to produce. That's if they have not even finished selling the country itself before then, because the way these ones are even, the impunity, the moment the thinking thieves and the unthinking thieves joined up together and the party lines became destroyed once and for all, nobody is pretending to be saintly or thief. Everybody are now revealed to be the thieves that they all are. The moment that happened, the scramble has been to just sell off this country, take anything, everybody's just looting and stealing audible feeding. If they ever bring light to bear on any other part beyond the NDDC or the, the disaster woman who is feeding people, you, you will be shocked at what is going on everywhere else. So please, they are selling us. They are selling us. They've already borrowed beyond our own lifetimes. Please speak. Speak in your own spaces. <sighs> Another question came and said, what has been the greatest obstacle for oppressed citizens in Nigeria to identify as a single class and see that their oppressors span across all tribes and religions? What has been, let me repeat that question. What has been the greatest obstacle for oppressed citizens in Nigeria to identify as a single class and see that their oppressors span across all tribes and religions. I'll tell you, there are several factors. One is systemic. The system is designed to break Nigerians into groups. It is not designed to unite. 
That's why you have the quota system, you have the catchment area, you have this one, you have that one. Everything that does not promote merit in Nigeria is designed to divide us as a people. There might have been points in the lifetime of Nigeria when there might have been need to do some structural um, adjustment of the space to help, not to hinder, but to help some other parts to accelerate their development. That was completely understandable. But think about it. How much advantage has these quotas yielded to the average persons for whom they were intended? At, no, 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 sorry, heresy. It was never intended for them on whose behalf they were claimed. How many of the schools that could have been built in the northern part of Nigeria were built? How many hospitals? How many roads? Rights were claimed in people's names, but the privileges were never ever delivered to them. So the Nigerian state is designed to break us into bits and pieces. That's why, as I have said before, you have more Odua Republic people in Nigeria than Nigerians, more Biafrans in Nigeria than Nigerians. You have more people from the Middle Belt than from Nigeria. You have more Fulani. You even have more Liverpool supporters in Nigeria than Nigerians. It is not by accident. It is by express design. Get it clear. Now, it is also not by accident that the same things that has constantly divided, that the same things that have constantly divided the Nigerian people systematically has never, ever, all these things have never once divided our rulers. The Yoruba ones marry the Fulani ones. The Igbo ones marry the Yoruba ones. The Christians marry the Muslims, even though they are all nominal religionists, vacuously religious. They marry each other. But they promote this hatred amongst us. It is by design. Because if we are ever united, we will not see the commonality of our oppressions of our pains. The Fulani man wants good schools for his children, at least the generality. The Igbo man will just want his own space to be able to be himself without the oppression that the Nigerian state has placed on his back. The Yoruba man just wants his peace. The TV, the Bio Bio, the Ijoma, everybody just wants to be the best that they can be under the Nigerian sun. But our rulers deliberately provoke and exacerbate our differences. Because if we ever become united, we then throw off the shackles from around our necks. A people that have been afflicted by weaponized ignorance, which is the root of weaponized poverty. Listen to their enslavers to point them the road to their freedom. You can't walk like that. So the things we need to do, part of that is what the like of me has come out to do, which is to wake you up. Just wake you up. Let you open your eyes. Stop allowing people to tell you who your enemies are. Eh? Stop allowing them to tell you who your enemies are. Please, the Biafran man wants the same thing, or rather, don't let me legitimize that one. The Igbo man, the Igbo man, my brothers across the East, all they want is their own space under the sun, where justice and law rules, where they are the same as any Emeka, or any Eweka, any Dele, any Usman. Everybody just wants to be respected given their own space to become who God has blessed them to be. That's all we want. If Nigeria ever produces that, nobody will want to break away anywhere. Why would we want to? Have you seen Aswaga, Niger? Well, nobody want to go anywhere. It's our rulers that promote these divisions. And now they're playing the end game. They're selling us. Wake up. They're selling us. So, 
is the divisions they promote. And it is up to us to reach those divides. Don't allow yourself to be told Igbo man is your enemy, or Fulani man is your enemy, or the Biobio man is your enemy, or the German that is your enemy. Well, and if you are going to be saying this German is this, that one is this, what right do you then have to complain about racism? Why, why would you even talk about racism if you have reduced another person's humanity on account of the language he speaks, in spite of the fact that he's your color? We are in the same nation. And for you, the only thing that will solve the problem is to walk away. You can't even resolve the problem within the place where you've been stuck for 60 years. A civil war, bloody one for that matter, has been fought unjustly. People have been punished and are still being punished. But these are all issues that will disappear if we ever found the courage to bet a Nigerian nation out of the different nationalities that are already here. And that can only happen if we have a state ruled by law. We have not been ruled by law since 1966. Another question, which I believe is, okay, I learned, okay. The last of the one that we had compiled before coming on here was, uh, how can we instill mass consciousness? What tools are needed to achieve this? And how can progress be measured? It's simple. The first thing you must recognize is this. The Nigerian system has had a long time to weaponize ignorance. In all the scriptures, ignorance is depicted as darkness. Darkness. Both in the Quran and in the Bible, ignorance is always depicted as darkness. And I'm sure even the Oriental religions, and even for those who are not religionists, nobody would argue with the fact that when light comes into a space, darkness disappears. The only way you fight ignorance is by deploying knowledge. And knowledge must always de be deployed systematically and strategically. I am not a very knowledgeable man. I know there are several people within the Nigerian space who are by far more knowledgeable than me. They need to start speaking. Speak. We all go to die anyway. All of us, I, I doubt I can live another 52 years. And I, even I don't want to live another 52 years. So what's the worst anyone is going to do to me for talking? He'll kill me, right? Nice one. Immortality beckons. Go ahead. So here is the point. Speak in your own space. Speak. Let us all prick each other's consciences. Yes, I said earlier on, I said, and it's true, we're all guilty. All of us, if you are a Nigerian, you've embraced evil. So don't go pointing any hypocritical finger. It's beyond changing a system. We need to change and renew our minds. It's a call to national transformation. We need to renew our minds. This is not sane. We need to, we need to start thinking beyond our lifetimes. You need to embrace the, think, the thinking that gets you to the point where you embrace the vision that Look, I need to plant trees so that my children and their children's children would enjoy the shade of a wooded boulevard. We need to start thinking like that. You can't be thinking about the biggest car, the biggest, all of us, we need to start thinking like that. As a race, we need to start thinking like that. The task is urgent. The Chinese are here. I was reading, it. I was, you know, one of these pop novels that you find on Facebook. This one was Chinese fiction. And I clicked on it. And I'm going to make sure. I know, I know I saved it on my Facebook page. And I'm going to find it and post it later on today. And what he said, I, I, something led me to read it. Very unlike me. I, I started reading and I saw it was a Chinese story. Sort of like, um, yeah, some novel. And what struck me about it was a part where a young man came into sudden money, a, an impoverished guy. He came into sudden money. 
and he was now trying to explain it. The novelist was trying to explain it, some cheap pop fiction, Chinese pop fiction translated into English. And the guy was like, oh, the family came into money in Africa. They now own 80% of the gold in Africa. So I realized that a race that sees a man as having been born into the status in which he lives, as I've explained yesterday, when I was talking about the way the world sees us, actually believes that Nigeria and Africa, rather, is the new frontier, the place to go and make your wealth. So all of a sudden, the paradise in which we live, but which we do not value, has become the Chinese promised land. And we're all sat here, and these idiots are busy signing contracts that they can't even read. So please, let us get it clear. This is beyond, this is beyond anything but, this is about our liberation. We, it's no longer about democracy. Forget that one. Fact is, we are not in a democracy. Stop lying to yourselves. This is a liberation struggle. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Please, wake up. So yes, there is a lot that can be done, but it's beyond, see, we need speak your truth in your space. That's how to wake awaken consciences. When you find the grace to keep quiet when evil is happening around you, all it does is that it legitimizes the evil. But that same evil might be visited on you the next day. So the issue of how do we raise consciousness is up to all of us. Whatever, however you know how to use it. You find an idiot like me ranting, share it if you believe in what he's saying. Share it. You see injustice happening in your space and you can step in. Step in. But this is beyond, it's not, this is not just about is the police. Oh, yes, the system is bad, but we ourselves are wicked. Wicked. We are wicked. The evil that goes on in places where you should find no evil in our country, we are wicked. So please, let's quit with the hypocritical protestations as if it were to be some uh, isolated problem, as if evil exists in our country in silos. It does not exist in silos. The evil in Nigeria is pervasive. All of us are complicit. All of us. But only us can fix this problem before it consumes us. So yeah, we need to wake ourselves up. I agree. I agree. But let's wake ourselves up on the right side. Not just wake up. Wake up on the right side. This is not one of those violent outbursts. Violence will not better anything. Going on the street plays into the hand of the system. Don't play into their hands. Let's talk to ourselves. Let's forget all these divisive arguments about tribes and uh, uh, let's break Nigeria. How do you do that? Anyway, don't let me get ahead of myself. I have a date with the secessionists on Monday. We have a date. We can have that argument on Monday. But the fact of the matter is that it is time we identify our common purposes and stop all these divisions that are just distractions that plays into the hands of those who are dividing us. I see I've done 46 minutes already. Anyway, um, my, okay, so three questions have been compiled whilst we've been on here. And they've been sent to me by my very nice, hardworking assistant. Sayo, thank you very much. Salute. So I have three from her. I see she's typing. I suspect I might have more. Okay, she says I have 15 minutes more. So fine. So I've got three questions hanging here. One is from a gentleman named Ola Dakwajai. He says, how can the middle class save itself from its disconnect and lack of critical consciousness? What can be done? Exactly what we're doing now and everything anyone else can do. Speak to them. Look. There is this funny Yoruba proverb, and I think it's about to start finding, <laughs> finding relativity within the Nigerian space. He says that 
ti ya oba ti kari ki to gbon that means that until you have democratized suffering it is really ever hands the nigerian middle class is about to come under intense attack by the nigerian ruling class it started already it's not accidental that the banks are already cutting jobs because hey, they're responsible to their board. Their job is to make money. You know, they are not running charities. So you can expect that a lot of companies will be responding to the COVID realities, which has changed the world forever. However much our government might want to pretend, COVID has changed the game. The system as it is has become completely unsustainable. They cannot even fund the cost of governance. They can't pay salaries based on their current income. So any money that they're actually borrowing, they're not borrowing to develop anything, is to loot, as they are looting. They've always looted. Even when we had money, they looted. So these ones that they are borrowing now, you better believe it, they are they are already, they is looted. In fact, if I suspect that they have looted before the money or whatever, they know how they do their thing. But be sure of one thing, anything they are borrowing is not in your interest or mine. So the mid Nigerian middle class will soon find very quickly that it is under concerted attack. Now, if you work in a bank and you became a manager and you just got your sack letter in the last week or two weeks, because I know there has been a gale of retrenchments in the banking industry in the last couple of weeks, and you can be sure it's a contagion. It's going to trickle down. So stock brokerage, uh, Almost all non-essential services, at least during this COVID pandemic, a lot of businesses have discovered that you know we actually don't need so many staff. So people are already cutting in response to the COVID thing. But beyond the COVID thing is the fact that the misgovernance has assured that inflation in Nigeria is growing faster than you will see anywhere else because there is nothing productive going on. Government remains the biggest business in the country. And the unimaginative leadership of Wari and his co and his coterie of, well, I beg, I, see, that bunch, they are so unimaginative that they are not able to create any employment to either take on people coming out of schools or coming of, out of any sort of training. There is no, there are no access to credit beyond agriculture as if everybody must go and, as if everybody must go and farm. What about the entrepreneurs? What about, look at the gentlemen, the young people who are trying to do Okada the other day. So look at what they've done to them. They just, the, the moment government saw that sector growing, it was how to kill that sector that entered their head. Not that they are thinking, let's kill it. Let's be clear. Mm, that would be fantastic. That is not the point. But it was, how much can we make out of these young men? How much can we get out of this? And immediately, the laws that had been long forgotten were dredged up. Immediately. And young men are being put out of business again because of this system that never put the citizens first. The citizens never factor. So the Nigerian middle class will soon find itself under concerted attack. And I suspect that it will soon learn that it is in its better interest to become involved in building the Nigerian nation, or at least the Nigerian state, and to become a little less insular, thinking that once they are capable of providing private tutoring, private schooling, uh, their own generate, you build the house, you become the local government. Now you have, you even have to become your own isolation center and hospital. So the Nigerian middle class, in all honesty, yes, I agree it's disconnected, but I believe the time has come for it to wake up and it will. Necessity will wake it up. That's the reality as far as I'm concerned. And then we will do what we can. We'll shout, we'll make our noise, and I hope that you too, from even your elocution, suggest that you're a member of that class yourself. Speak to your friends, speak to your family members, talk to your employees, talk to your employers, speak to the people in your own space, speak your truth. It can't be left only to madmen walking the streets 
I said the other day that if you want immortality in the land of liars, just speak truth to them. Speak your truth. Speak your own. Speak it. One gentleman named Omar Jali Monday asked, what effective role can the youth play in putting an end to the bad governance system? Tune in. Tune in. Because all these arguments are really not about old men like myself. I am 52. I was born into a Nigeria that functioned. You know that the Saudi lawyer house used to come to UCH in Ibado for their treatment. It was a center of excellence for tropical medicine in the entire wide world. They used to come to UCH in Ibado. When you see the decayed infrastructure in UCH, and you remember how some of those infrastructure are the buildings, and you realize that they are still finer than the new ones that they are building, you realize just how far we are falling. So yeah, the youth should be connected. How old was, how old were these, the, the current set of bandits, most of them ruling us today, some of them were not even 30 years old when they had hijacked the country. Yeah. They were not even 30 years old when they had hijacked Nigeria. Some of them are over 80 now. They are still busy telling you who should rule Nigeria. What did they do with the time that they had? So any argument that we are having today, anything that the like of me is saying is actually in the hope that I might connect with you, the youth. That's why I titled it. I said, youth quick. I'm trying to wake you up. If the numbers of you that are connected to Big Brother Nigeria, we want to come on, come on, guys. We were kids ourselves. No, I'm no shrinking violet. We watched porn growing up. Nobody is saying don't watch porn. If the government is stupid, enough, well, the government is not stupid actually. It was it was a good time to start Big Brother Nigeria. It distracts you. It takes you away. August five was coming. Yele was calling for street demonstrations. Imagine you are not connected to your big brother Africa, we were big brother Nigeria. And then there is a famous one where all of you is like you have never seen a woman's mammary gland in your life. And then that is what is taking your attention instead of the struggle for your liberation. So yeah, you guys need to focus. You need to get off whatever is taking you. Look, when we were growing up, you snuck around to smoke weed. Nigerian youth these days are on the streets, smoking weed on the streets. And nobody is saying anything. No, no, Nigeria police is not interested in you, but dare to carry a placard saying, I demand good governance. The same you that he ignored when you were busy doing your shit. He's going to grab you. You are the criminal. Look at gambling. You can't watch a football match seeing anything less than 80 minutes of gambling advertisement. In a country with a teeming youth population who are not in school or have any training, gambling addiction, every corner you turn, there is a lot of chaos. Every part of Nigeria, everybody has become gamblers. And the, con the government is happy. At least you are distracted. You are distracted. So you need to connect yourselves because it is actually about your future. Me, I've done my gig. I've done my gig. But fun. I've lived a good life. I was born at a time when Nigeria functioned, like I said. And I've been blessed. I've lived a good life. It's your lives. It's your lives. You need to wake up. Connect yourselves to the struggle for your emancipation, for your liberation. Talk to your friends. If you are, if you are woke enough to know that this is wrong, talk to them. Um, the last of the questions, well, the gentleman named Zupi Okonko asks, what do you think is the more pragmatic way to end the social malaise in Nigeria? Part of the matter is that only a revolution will save Nigeria. And I say that clearly and unambiguously, but I also mark it and underline it by making clear that the revolution I seek in Nigeria is one that is completely non-violent. 
we need to turn around. That's not just about government. It's about we as individuals. It's about us having the capacity to see beyond today. My friend and partner in the law office that I founded, Ralph Nwoke, he once said to me, he said, I know, he didn't say, he had it posted on his BBM status. He said, if you want to live under a mango tree, if you want to enjoy the shade of a mango tree in your old age, you should plant the seed in your youth. See that proverb, eh? It led to the death of one useless tree. Not every tree is useless. I'm not suggesting the tree is useless, but it was not a fruiting tree. So I removed the non-fruiting tree and I planted a mango seed. That must be about five years ago. Today, as it pleases God, whenever the season delivers mangoes, I eat the mango fruits. We have to be deliberate. Let me repeat myself. We have to be deliberate about our choices because our choices to a very large extent, have a lot to do with the outcome. The only way to end this madness is to readdress the basis of citizenship in the Nigerian state. That is the revolution right there. When you reassess the basis of citizenship, nobody will need to tell you that you shouldn't have 36 states, 774 local governments. Nobody will need to tell you that you should provide education, that you should provide good roads, you should provide security. Nobody will need to tell you. I look forward to seeing you gentlemen and ladies on Monday. No, sorry. Yeah, on Monday. And yeah, Quenu. <laughs> and then my Mbati Mbati brothers, you want to do a republic too? We'll see on Monday. I look forward to a robust debate with you, my darling secessionist brothers and sisters. Not be fight. May we educate ourselves. Your arguments are distractions, and I intend to demolish them. See you on Monday. Thank you, everybody. And thank you very much for having given me the benefit of your time, spending your data. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.